Okay, friends. Recently there was a discussion again on uh, Reddit about uh, what style is band made. And the question was actually, is band made prog? Uh, this discussion uh, is restarted like every time, you know, very often. Uh, what's funny about it is that actually uh, people don't understand or like don't formulate what prog rock is. So very often discussions like meaningless because people say like I love prog or I hate prog. But then when they start to mention the examples of what is prog rock, quite often, uh, for instance, this is like I consider myself like really a prog rock lover. You know, I my favorite bands were always of prog rock. But then they mentioned the bands which I never listened to. But it seems like prog rock is like has a few segments. Like there are certain groups in one segment and some groups in another. And then people all call them prog. I don't know why, actually. Maybe these bands themselves identify them as prog. But there's a huge difference, actually, between the bands like, say, Dream Theater, which I never listened to. To be honest, I know them by now. But I first heard them like, I don't know, even... Uh, Eve, like 2012, I guess I just looked now into the history of my listens on YouTube. But it seems the first I discovered them in like 2012 when I was already deep into Japanese music and stuff like that. And uh, the music, Japanese music, which I considered like really, really prog, like uh, Yuyo Yupe or this Utsupi or all this Vocaloid stuff. Uh, so I thought that Okay, let me just try to organize it, you know, how I see it. I understand that the vision is different, but I try to mention also what other people think about it and what, uh, what my understanding is of what is prog rock. Okay, that's the, the discussion on Reddit where it all started. Uh, is band made a new form of prog rock? So, yeah, there is a lot of things there and uh, people mention like uh, again dream theater or whatever <laughs> sneaky prog <laughs> so evolution of various forms of rock uh, all mashed up together so some people say <laughs> they're missing one of the fundamental pillars of prog rock they don't suck <laughs> so in minds of many people uh, prog rock is something really boring, you know, all these slow winded uh, compositions, you know, of like 10, 20 minutes or whatever. And uh, uh, yeah, so funny that like the things, the bands, which are really considered like the pillars of prog rock, like the, the real, the real what prog rock is, nobody ever mentions. So, okay, let me... Put it all straight. Okay, that's how I see. Okay, uh, this is, let's give us an example. This is bandmate sense, right? Bandmate sense. So, I postulate that uh, bandmate quotes actually from uh, a, a very prog rock composition which is called the Devil's Triangle by King Crimson. And I will just show you a few seconds of it. It starts at some, well, it starts at the end of Konami's solo. Uh, to somewhere like at 2.20, but uh, it's just a few seconds, which I will demonstrate. Okay, listen to it. Okay, once again, just seven seconds yet, just seven seconds, so even less, like, okay, 220 again, again. Okay, here it is. Now, okay, the bands which I considered always prog, 
who were they? King Crimson, first, it's 1969. Yeah, they started Wonder Grab Generator. They started in 68. Uh, uh, Pink Floyd, of course. Yeah, Pink Floyd is like, yeah, I would also call them progressive. Yeah, they they a bit different genre, but at least the early Pink Floyd is definitely like pretty much like King Crimson and the Wonder Grab Generator. Then Yes, and Yes was also not very prog at the beginning. They were quite pop. They were actually like, I would even say they, they copied Beatles a lot in their like two probably first albums. So they became prog only when, um, yeah, Bill Bruford, I think, uh, joined them a bit later. So, okay, like real prog is like uh, Fragile, Fragile album, yeah, by Yes. And then the next one, um close to the edge close to the edge and then i stopped listening to them because they they really became what <laughs> this person said here constable blimey chips yeah that they really became very strange after close to the edge so i, I was like okay i'm pro guy but not that pro uh, who else? Genesis. Yeah, I recognize that Genesis is also prog rock, but also quite different genre, I would say. I never listened to Genesis. They they seem a bit strange to me. Like, not strange, but it's not, not up my alley, not my cup of tea. But yeah, I recognize that, yes, of course, prog rock. Yeah, with uh, Peter Gabriel, at least. So with uh, Phil Collins, it's like yeah, questionable. They, they also shifted more towards pop in the end uh, but yeah early early genesis with uh, uh gabriel very much so what else what else what else of those early things yeah which really like if we talk about definition of prog so we have to talk about uh, the time when it all started I'd, okay enough if i if i will remember something else i also yeah i know that people often mention like Gentle Giant, Procol Harum, all that stuff. I tried to listen to them, really, yeah. But they seem also like very pop to me. Yeah, I don't know. Just, I, I would not consider them really prog. Yeah. Maybe they're not heavy enough. I don't know, because I'm also a metalhead. So, okay. Uh, let's refresh our memory. Band made sense. Okay, here it is. Now, back to King Crimson, Devil's Triangle. It's a very long uh, composition. It's like uh, 11 minutes, 37 seconds. It, it's from their second album uh, in the wake of uh, Poseidon. Poseidon? Okay, how, how it is pronounced. So, uh, and it's... Uh, that's what definition of prog is to me. Because Wondercraft Generator at this time was not also really prog. The true prog album from Wondercraft Generator is their uh, album Pawn Hearts. That's what I really love always. And that's uh, actually where they collaborated with Robert Fripp. So let me show you Wondercraft Generator. Come on, Undercraft Generator, Bone Hearts. Yeah, there were these early ones, like um, uh, the first one is uh, Aerosol and Grey Machine. It's also very prog actually, but uh, I, I love actually this album, Aerosol and Grey Machine. Uh, also quite prog, yeah, that's what I would call prog. But then like in this Pawn Hearts, they really became heavy and they were becoming heavy and heavier with time. Like this God Bluff and then um, ah, this this performance at uh, Belgian TV was a very nice Plague of Lighthouse Keepers actually from the Pawn Hearts. 
as well. Whatever. Okay. I will I will not talk about Van der Graaff generator now because uh, a few people actually know them. they like relatively unknown band. But King Crimson is like everybody knows King Crimson. King Crimson is not like really a band. <laughs> King Crimson is a school of music. It's a school of thought. It's a philosophical school, really. So they had like, I don't know, like 100, 200 musicians which were involved in various projects around Robert Fripp and other guys who participate in King Crimson. So it's like really, really a school of thought. So, um, <laughs> damn, I talk too much. Uh, so, sorry again. Let's refresh our memory once again. So this vocal line in the end. Okay, now. Okay, <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> you probably consider it like a, a form of torture to listen to that sort of music, but I really love this composition. It's it's like that most of the time, but it's actually close to the end where they really go go ham, you know, it really becomes like an avant-garde or something. But this piece, uh, you, you've heard it, yeah? It's like the instruments which are just, crumble into chaos you know so they play in their lines and then they sort of s fall into like screeching you know and uh, screaming and whatever and just you know fall into pieces you know just the the melody the melodical line just crumbles yeah and then it's like brought back to life by the vocal uh harmony vocal melody this thing in Devil's Triangle is actually uh, a sample of Greg Lake vocals from the previous album. This one, I guess, is from In the Court of the Crimson King song. So this this is actually the, the vocal hook from In the Court of the Crimson King. They basically inserted this as a sample here just for fun i guess but that's how it uh, uh okay this same like uh, 10 seconds or whatever i'll bring it back to you okay listen to it again and try to compare it to sense to that moment after konami's solos here where also all the guitars and bass and drums that fall into chaos and then psyche brings them back with uh, with her vocal line so yeah of course it, uh, okay Konami's idea is don't be alone yeah like don't compose the songs of 12 minutes or 8 or 20 minutes or whatever uh, don't be alone, yeah, says Konami, uh, because it's 21st century and already, and uh, that's their idea. They they nothing like in Crimson, of course, yeah, but I consider them as really like um, uh, successors of this huge musical history of this line, you know, and they very much... Yeah, I still, I, uh, that's my statement. They very much like prog, so, okay. And here.
Okay, also the overall feeling. It's not like uh, just technical similarities, you know, like uh, Band Mate, uh, like technically uses the same, you know, twists and turns and the hooks and whatever. No, the idea of King Crimson, why it was, it is so important for, for the music, for the musical industry as such, is because they really have created that school of thought. You know, Robert Tripp had this idea of like, what is King Crimson? The goal of King Crimson, uh, I should have found that quote before, uh, because he actually stated the goal of King Crimson is to uh, bring order from chaos and like meaning from something. Yeah, so it was like um, one of their albums is a radical action to unseat the hold of the monkey mind. So uh, Robert Fripp was a follower of that philosophy. Um, the Russian philosopher Gurdjieff uh, from the early 20th century. He actually belonged to uh, a community, to a it was sort of like quasi-religion, I would say. Uh, with Gurdjieff being like sort of a prophet. Not really, but Gurdjieff, uh, mm, he put great emphasis on music as ways of spiritual development. Uh, I should mention here that actually Baha'u'llah, the founder of Baha'i faith to which I belong, he also says that music is a stairway to heaven. No, he says the music is a ladder to the realm on high by which the souls ascend. He says, don't uh, turn it into the winds of uh, passion. So the music can be both ladder to the realm on high and it can be winds of passion, which will just, it's funny, yeah, because ladder to the realm on high is like where you slowly climb, yeah? And winds is where you just, woo, sort of fly, yeah? But uh, yeah, if you would, ask people what is spiritual development they would often say it's wins to my life and then Baha'u'llah says like no wins like it's something uh, if you want to reach your destination yeah you better employ some systematic approach not just like like that guy the uh, the winner of um, Darwin Price, yes, who who had a car and he installed a rocket launcher. I think he actually took it from um, a shuttle or somewhere so that uh, solid state um, booster, I think it was. So he just installed it in his car and wanted to reach uh, some great speed. So he said in his car, just choosing a road which was really like straight for pretty a lot of miles, like 10 miles or 12 miles. And so he started to move and then turned that booster that launcher. And he ended up his life at the speed of like, like 400 miles per hour, uh, because there was uh, a cliff at the end of the road. So the road was finally turning, but of course he was flying with such a huge speed. He just you know, flew straight into that cliff and won the Darwin Prize. Uh, so don't uh, use these sort of things, the wins for your spiritual development will, will not take you anywhere. Like, uh, it, it's not real wins. It's like, uh, it gives you a kick, so you fly. But since we're not birds, except for a certain little pigeon, but that pigeon is 810 years old, so she knows how to fly. But as normal humans, we we don't possess wings. You know, we fly when only somebody gives us a mighty kick, then we fly. Now, so the idea of King Crimson, Robert Fripp was that, yes, music can be like, yeah, also, okay, Led Zeppelin, yeah, Stairway to Heaven, it was the same idea. That music is uh, something which you just use to climb, to like really move your soul to the realization of something bigger, you know, of some spiritual verities and stuff like that. So that 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 is connected, uh, in my mind at least, like my definition of prog is music dedicated to that, you know. 
it's not only technicalities like uh, King Crimson composing, you know, these crazy things, you know, or like Wonder Graph Generator also composing like, what are these songs like? Uh, this 48 minutes, this album, and it has uh, uh, a song which is like, poo -poo -poo, like 23 minutes long or something. So, yeah, it, it, that's not necessarily prog. Well, formally it can be, but okay, whatever. That's also, well, that's also the similarity uh, with Bandmate. Uh, that guy actually, I quoted it in that discussion and read it. Um, oh, we're discussing Crimson. Ah, this uh, Brunan G. He said that uh, hopelessly dark. What the hell is going on in Robert Fripp's soul? <laughs> but my concert's music is in total opposite of King Crimson and I love them both. So, uh, it's strange that in my mind they're really, really similar, even in attitude, because, you know, Konami always composes their songs in minor key. Uh, Kabata's lyrics are just very gloomy often, like take Rinne, for instance. Okay, Rinne may be like an extreme example, but uh, most of the lyrics are like that. You know, it's all about, you know, suffering and stuff. And like my favorite songs like uh, Puzzle, for instance, yeah? Like, uh, okay, even even softer things like Smile, for instance. Smile acoustic, you know, where Psyche was crying on stage. Really, there were tears in her eyes when she was singing. Of course, it's like, okay, uh, she's addressing the fans which, whom she cannot see and stuff like that. So it's like, yeah, more like tear-jerking song like about us, or Smile, whatever. But even the heavy stuff... Uh, it's also pretty much about that. Take whatever you want. It's the the music of band is not so really optimistic. It's like the life is difficult, life is hard, but don't surrender. That's actually the message which bandmate brings us. Yeah. So uh, there was a guy I quoted here called Kevin. Maybe I'll yeah, a guy named Kevin. I said has written a comment on YouTube. Well, there was a reaction video. And uh, this guy, Kevin, has left a very nice quote, um, comment. Uh, and he says that uh, uh, what the maze do, which nobody has done for me in a long time, is to produce music that is enjoyable both to the casual listener and the discerning music geek. I think you, for example, would really like, uh, he addresses the guy who just directed and he suggests uh, a couple of albums. They can crank out catchy hooks at will, but lace the song with subtle and not so subtle complexity. So you can listen to the same damn song 200 times in a month and still not get sick of it because you keep hearing cool stuff that you never heard before. That actually what happens to me. I listen to uh, bandmate songs like uh, yeah, when Sense was released, I listened to it like, I don't know, just 10 times in a day just over and over all three songs in a loop and then uh yeah i listen to it like also for a week or two also like every day for 10 times whatever so and it was like gradually gradually i started to understand things which happen in there like uh, songs like okay sense i heard before that because it was like opening for anime and mv was released uh uh, in October, somewhere like that, yeah. And then uh, Karalium and Hibana, really complicated songs. And uh, actually, I would say probably not so overly complicated as many things in Unseen World, but still, still, I mean, people who can get them from on the first listen, I think they have uh, the mostly professional musicians. And even in this case, they often say, Oh, I need to listen to it like a dozen more times to understand what's happening because there are so many uh, things. Okay, and then what Kevin also says, he says, then add to this their ability to just make you feel happier, almost ridiculously so to the point where we start blithering on about how they make us cry our eyes out. 
guilty. Me too. And so many of us are sick and tired of COVID politics, hate and fear mongering media and on and on. The mates are the antidote for us and that's not hyperbole. Th that's what happened to me. Uh, I, I should say that band mate really saved my life in a sense. You know, because I'm like, okay, I'm uh, maybe I'm thinking too much, uh, but I'm really trying to understand, the, as Miko says, what do you live for? If we consider the meaning of life seriously, like what do we live for? We have to recognize that nothing. Uh, whatever we do, all the material things we do will be finished when we die, right? So if at this very moment something happens, I don't know, like um, a comet falls, falls from the sky, you know, just destroys my house and I die. Or tomorrow I catch uh, another strain of COVID and die from it in two weeks. Yeah. Or I don't know, whatever can happen, you know, lots of things can happen. I can just go on the street and just... Uh, sleep and fall under the car and I'll be dead, you know. So, okay, I may live for another 50 years and then die a natural death, but nobody ever will escape it, right? And whatever you've done will be of no value for you unless there is some immortal soul, right, which can benefit after the death of your material body. But that's not what many people believe or like at least not don't talk about it openly. When you ask people, what do you live for? They start to say, oh, I live to be happy. I live like to raise my kids. I live uh, to do my job. You know, I live to make money. Uh, I live to eat tasty food. I live for the sake of listening to nice music, to go into the concerts and whatnot, right? But then they say, okay, you do all these things and then you die in the end. So what was the purpose of it all? So these are, uh, yeah, like the natural conclusion is that, yes, that's how it all ends. But, okay, I, I became a religious person precisely because of that, because Baha'u'llah explains why. He says, yeah, yeah, it's, a, yeah, of course, the life has no meaning. He said, all this world in the estimation of the people of Baha, so the, the people who um, near near to God. He says, oh, the whole world is worth uh, less than a black in the eye of a dead ant. So it's like, he says, like ashes, uh, nothing more. So yes, material world, of course, doesn't matter. Like everybody understands that. Of course, it's like ash, and even less but it's a training ground so basically okay i invented another uh, analogy for myself that world is like the matrix you know that movie yeah the matrix recently there was uh, another episode of it but i didn't even watch it but the matrix the, the first matrix uh, the first episode actually was the, the most interesting i would say so the very idea, yeah, that uh, we live in a virtual world, that this world is not real. Uh, that's what actually all religions says. If you even go as back as like this uh, Hindu religion, you know, like 5,000 years, where it says that this world is Mara. Yeah? So it's like the, the illusion. This world is just an illusion, you know. But there is a certain sense in it. If there would be no sense, we would not be able even to ask ourselves, <laughs> what, what do we live for? So we live for the training. Indeed, it's like uh, it's like the matrix. Yeah, we, we live here in order to learn something. And then when we die, we'll be benefiting from what we have learned in this world. So uh, that's not what many people actually say openly or like consciously. Even I, I would be curious actually to, yeah, I was, I was dreaming often, like I would talk to Miko about it, but yeah, first I need to learn Japanese on a necessary level <laughs> to talk to her about that. 
but um, uh, what is her understanding of the meaning of life? Because I see that in her lyrics, she's she's really one of the deepest philosophers of our time. That's what I always repeat, because she is asking this question and she's given the answers. So my answer, based on my love for bandmate and um, what I learned from bandmate, why well, I say that Miku Kabata is my role model, yeah, all that stuff. They create beauty. So what? What do we need to carry us through this meaningless life? Yeah. How how should we live this life through until it ends? So the overall thing is like, yeah, there must be beauty, you know, because there is a difference how to live the life. Yeah. Some people live it very ugly and they suffer themselves and make everybody else around them suffer. And then there are some people who create beauty and bring joy to the people around them. So, okay, since I'm a religious person, I believe that we are here uh, for the happiness, for the beauty, and not for ugliness, suffering, violence, war, whatever. So the position of bandmate and Miku herself is very clear. Uh, when they released uh, the Dragon Cries, and especially the MV, you know what the uproar was among the fans. Why do you show us the ugliness of this world? Because that's what we are not used to. Why you bandmate, we came here to see you, to see your beauty, and now you show us the ugliness. But that's life. That's what bandmates just flipped the coin, you know. They want to see the world beautiful, and that's how the dragon cries ends. That phoenix flies, the dragon, uh, the dragon cries. Yeah, the phoenix flies. But before that, where we are now, we're in a very terrible situation. We we destroy the earth, all these piles of garbage, starving children. People don't have any pure water to drink. You know, children trying to catch this uh, water, which is like uh, rusty and. Uh, orange so polluted with chemicals or whatever you know uh white bears dying because of uh, global warming because we just want to live life mindlessly without caring about environment and all that stuff so of course this world is bent mate is not happy about this world they conquered it and then they came and see that this world is not is not good it's not nice Bandmate is unhappy about this world, guys, and they tell us openly. So whatever you like it or not, but that's reality. But they don't dwell on it uh, as most metal bands or like these rock bands or hard rock heavy metal bands, which are really depressing, always depressing. Like it's almost like the mark of the genre. Yeah, if you metal, you must be black, depressing. Uh, negative, you know, talk about death, destruction, filthy stuff, you know, all the things. Bandmate is not like that. That's like when you play them to a metalhead, they say, ah, it's not metal. Ah, it's pop. It's poppy because bandmates show us beauty. They don't dwell on ugliness of this world. So, and that's what actually I remember there was one moment uh, it was last year, yes, so somewhere in like May or yeah, somewhere like that, when they finally released the Blu-ray with um, Dave Budakan show, yeah. Ah, oh, no, they released first, no, no, it was yeah, a bit early when they released this Lion Cube Shibuya concert from February 14. So when it finally was released, I think it was like May. May 26, something like that. So it took them some time for it to be released. And then, okay, I got it. Yeah, somewhere like early, early summer. And I was very much depressed at the time. I don't remember why. Maybe I was really tired or something. I was just like really down. So when it arrived, I just, uh, okay, I copied it to my hard drive and then prepared to enjoy it. And I sat there, you know, it was already night, so I turned off all the lights and was trying to watch it. And somewhere like in 20 minutes, 
I understood what the meaning of life is. The meaning of life is to create beauty. Like I watched on the screen and I saw five amazing girls, you know, who, okay, the psyche says even nobody's like us can become anything we want. Yeah, she sings it in a smile. So that's what they're telling us. Even nobody's like us can become anything we want. And then I saw, yeah, just why, why are you so much depressed? Just throw, throw this depression away. Don't sigh, you know, don't uh, sit there saying, ah, life is meaningless. Yeah, of course it's meaningless, but just go ahead, create some beauty. If you do something what bandmate does, if you create at least like 10% of such beauty as bandmate is able to create, you, you will bring so much happiness to people around you. You will save lives. You're like, I, okay, I'm not uh, doing suicide attempts anymore. I did them in university <laughs> like at, at least five times or something. Because then, uh, back then, there were, I, I haven't found uh, Baha'i faith yet, and there were no spiritual literature or any talk about this. I asked everyone around, like, what's the meaning of life? People said, just to live. Uh, come on, just to live and then to die. So, yeah, I'm not uh, trying to end my life now, but I'm still, like, I need some somebody to demonstrate to me that life... Uh, what, what life is for. And that's what Bentmate is doing. And that's what actually what uh, King Crimson was doing, you know, in fact. Yes, their music can be quite depressing uh, at first. Like, not depressing, heavy. They're very heavy. So, oh, damn, 37 minutes. Uh, I actually wanted to listen together with you to this song, uh, The World's My Oyster Soup kitchen flow wax museum it's from the album the construction of light uh, by uh, 2000 year 2000 ah, okay i don't care 37 minutes okay let's listen to it it's only like six and a half minutes so let's listen to it uh, i will switch to lyrics it's from the official channel king crimson so uh, they they very open about copyright, from what I understand. So Rick Beata, I think, was talking about it, that King Crimson is pretty much open about copyright. So they publish, I think, all whatever releases they have, they just put them on YouTube gradually. Okay. Okay, a few words about it. <laughs> I didn't want to stop it at first, but then I thought, yeah, let, let me say what I think about it. So... That's, I don't know whether you consider it like a good example of prog. Uh, I thought about it. That's, you know, when Bandmate released Unseen World, I was like, yes, yes, that's the music I love. Because that's the music I love. That's the music I love. You know, that that's really my cup of tea this construction of light they have softer songs in this album uh but what you hear is okay it's prog right that's what i consider prog this play with the old uh timings you know and this a lot of layers you know very complex music as well uh but also very catchy that's what bandmate also does. You know, they they don't do complexity for the sake of complexity. They have a hook. They they have a melody. Because melody is hooking our mind. Yeah. If you want to get inspired, if you want to take your soul up, you need something. Uh, you need that ladder. You know, if it's just a bunch of some old metal details lying on the ground, you may say, oh. They are so complicated, these metal details, but it's not a ladder. No, the ladder is not so complicated. It's simple, right? It just... So... Okay, these, these lyrics are... 
also funny, yeah, because he basically, you know, piles in all sort of nonsense here. But that's how the world is. That's what he wants to tell us. He just, it's like the flashes of things, like uh, head bandana, Graham Cracker, Jack Hammer. So it's like the world, my oyster soup. So what I consider this um, image, it's like really the soup of all sort of stuff, you know, just just thrown into your head by the media, by whatever you see in the world. It's very depressing at the same time, yeah. But yeah, just that's King Crimson, this uh, male band, yeah. So male bands were always depressing. That's where heavy metal came from, yeah. What I love about bandmate and what people love about female bands now coming from Japan, for instance, yeah, that they're optimistic. They show us the negative side of life, but they also demonstrate the beauty of it. And their message is like to carry it forward. So, okay, let's get back to, to the song. A few comments. <laughs> I wanted to do the same sort of um, analysis video for Manners, where Bandmate is doing a very similar thing, where they just quote from their old songs and their old imagery uh, from the previous albums and stuff, even the images on the screen, you know, and it's in the lyrics as well. So that's what uh, King Crimson is doing here. They they also, they're an old band. Yeah, it's 2000, so they started in 69. So it's like... Uh, over 30 years of history at that point. So, uh, Lark Stan in Cheek. So he plays with words, yeah. Lark Stan's in Aspic. Uh, it's a famous uh, composition, uh, not a song, it's all instrumental. But they're like Lark Stan's in Aspic part one and part two. They actually, they have album Lark Stan's in Aspic. Uh, then they, on further albums they had like up to Lux Dance and Aspic part five or something so it's like they, they keep continuing it. Uh it's an image of uh Lux Dance in Aspic. It was a dish prepared for the Chinese Emperor two thousand years ago or something. Uh there is a certain day in uh in the year when they believe that larks seen the most beautifully. So the servants were catching these larks. You know that larks are small, yeah? Larks are small. So, and the towns, of course, <laughs> even smaller. They're just tiny. And uh, so they were catching a lot of these larks to make uh, a little dish with these lark stands in Aspic for a Chinese emperor. It was believed that uh, the emperor will magically gain some magic voice to speak to his subjects, you know, from this dance because the larks were singing very beautifully this morning. It's like the, the best uh, morning in the whole year or something like that. So that's like larks dancing cheek, but also tongue in cheek and stuff like that. Yeah. Then he says, yeah, nothing lasts forever. <laughs> forever green. <laughs> Uh, what else? Ah, frame by frame. It's also the one of the famous songs. Frame by frame. So it's uh, from that 2081, I guess. Yeah, the, the first album with uh, Adrian Balloon, who's the, the vocalist here as well. So they, they have these funny references. Pretty much like Bent Mate, I should say. Okay, let's continue. Yes, that's what this prog, yeah? Okay, you may say, yeah, yeah, <laughs> six and a half minutes and uh, two minutes of it are guitar solo and uh, piano solo, yeah, so which are very proggy. That's, uh, so that's what prog is to me, and that's why I believe, I believe that Bandmate is prog rock. Actually, it's interesting that as a beautiful Shinji mentioned here. Tony Visconti said so. He says Tony Visconti is also believes that it's uh, uh, J. Prog. 
he said, you've heard about J-Rock? Bandmate, you've heard of J-Pop? They are J-Proc Rock. They shred. Saw them last night. So, yeah. Tony Sun. <laughs> so, this guy knows a thing or two about what is prog rock, yeah, being a producer of Ch David Bowie. So, so guys, I had to say it all. Sorry, it became really long, almost like one hour, 52 minutes now. But I think these sort of videos uh, should be recorded this way. I just uh, was full of emotions about this topic because it's really like, it's a very controversial thing, yeah. And I thought I, I should just talk about it without much preparation. So, peace.